Okay, hi. Uh, I'm Damon Morelli. You may know me, you may not know me. Uh, I'm going to give a, a quick, short presentation titled Returning Life to Education, a primer to You Can't Teach. Um, first off, uh, I will be showing some slides in the background. You should be able to access these slides from this YouTube video uh, under the more information section there will be a link to these slides so you can look at the slides as you listen to me speak. Um, I'll also apologize for my unnerving habit of often saying, um, it's a bad habit, I'll try to break it, I probably won't be successful. <clears throat> Another bad habit I have is I have trouble being brief and as such this video is a little quite difficult for me because this should be a short video. Uh, you see, I gave a presentation back in December titled, You Can't Teach the Self-Organization of Cognitive Systems. Uh, you can also find the link to that video uh, on this YouTube page in the More Info section. Um, that presentation was very technical and academic, uh, and involved um, a great deal of research, and it was over three hours long. That presentation was very important, and I uh, especially to me, and the message of that presentation it, I think really needs to be disseminated uh, out there broadly to a wide audience. Uh, however, most people are not interested or willing to dedicate three hours of their life to listening to me speak, and I understand that. Um, that's reasonable. If what I say in this short video really catches your attention, uh, catches your interest and you want to learn more about the research and the resources that led me to my current position, well, then I encourage you to watch that video. <clears throat> so, why am I doing this? Why am I speaking into the camera? Uh, the same as you, actually, I want to share. In my case, I want to share with you uh, recent research from the, from the, the broad field of cognitive science uh, and the implications that this research has for learning and for the, the, the field of education. Um, why, why do I feel that this, that this information needs to be shared? Well, part of it comes from a recognition that there is a serious misunderstanding, uh, a common misunderstanding of mind and learning within our society, or within our society. Uh, our, our understanding is mistaken. And this misunderstanding has resulted in a buildup of a, a massively regimented uh, educational structure that does not accurately reflect the biology of learning. Uh, not just figuratively. We literally torture the life out of our children in the name of education. Um, and furthermore, this, this cold, industrial, educational structure actually modifies our cognition and, then, and thusly affects the path of civilization. <clears throat> this, this video, this, this short talk I'm, I'm giving here, is not an attack on educators. It's not an attack on teachers or administrators nor is it singling out parents. Um, this flawed philosophical approach that we have to education is, is actually centuries in the making. Um, fortunately, we know that um, uh, transitional periods of significant change can occur quite abruptly, and so I'm, we're hoping that we can really um, catalyze a, a, um, a massive transition within our educational system. Soon. Um, in fact, I'm really excited about education. I'm really excited about the future of education. I suspect that our educational system within the next 10 years will, within 10 years, will look nothing like it looks today. Um, on a superficial level, I think that our schools will not resemble the, the behemoth cubicle structures that they are today. Um, yet, yet more importantly, in the coming years, um, 
I, I think our overall conceptualization of curriculum and learning will meaningfully transform. And I don't use the word meaningfully lightly. <clears throat> this, this transformation of education will positively affect our children. Um, and it will ultimately broadly diffuse through our civilization as our children mature. Uh, in the future, our learners will not associate pain and suffering with the process of learning and school. Uh, in fact, um, our, our centers of learning will accommodate all learners in all their different learning styles according to all their different types of personalities. We will have strategies in place that um, to meaningfully motivate all students. There will be no such thing as a bad student. Um, or actually, I don't think there's even any such thing as a bad student now, although I'm sure maybe some teachers will disagree with me. Um, I think in the same way that a person has fond memories of a great party or a great trip, uh, learners in the future will reflect upon uh, their time in school with feelings of, uh, with, with positive emotions, um, with positive feelings when they, when they reflect upon their time in school. Uh, in a sense, learners will not likely ever consciously think about learning uh, and even realize that they are learning. And, and certainly they will never consciously think about studying. Um, I'm, I'm really confident that soon children will wake up, jump out of bed, and rush to school. Not because they have to, but because they really want to. Um, kind of uh, th their motivation to go to school or their motivation to learn will be in the same spirit that gets you and I out of bed early in the morning for a sporting event, right? Or to, to go skiing or to go snowboarding or something like that. Um, or it'll be in the same, um, <clears throat> the same spirit that, that causes you and I to, to stay up late talking to friends or to um, stay up all night playing games. I'm talking about a massive revolution in education that will accelerate learning and improve learning outcomes for all children and actually uh, for all learners, including adults as well. <clears throat> for us to achieve this, this radical shift in um, uh, our education system, we need to appreciate what modern cognitive science is telling us. Uh, and we need to confront and come to terms with some pervasive illusions that we have within society. Uh, quite literally, these illusions are preventing us from achieving our potential um, uh, as a society. Uh, I will begin with an examination of, of, um, of some long-standing myths and illusions and then I will transition into cognition and learning. Uh, and, and again, another great example of, of, a, of a common illusion would be how we commonly uh, think about the mind uh, and cognition. Uh, the, I, the, our common perception is that the mind is uh, within the brain um, and that our mind is only inside of our head, that our mind uh, functions as a kind of machine uh, a com uh, metaphorically a computer um, and that, pr that internalizes and processes information in a logical, rational way. Um, it's an illusion. It's, that's not the case. Um, anyways, um, so just a, a quick example of a, of a common myth within our society is that a person's intellectual ability is primarily related to um, her or his um, genes. Um, a mountain of research in recent years has, has shown this to be unequivocally false. Uh, I suspect that the persistence of this genetic rationale is largely to validate the status quo and to explain away 
um, uh, certain uh, the certain undesirable social outcomes that persist within our society. Uh, as Dr. Gabor Matei puts it, quote, the genetic argument is simply a cop-out, uh, which allows us to ignore the social and economic and political factors, end of quote. Essentially, he's talking about that, that we really fail to ignore the environmental effects upon um, uh, ourselves and how this then affects outcomes. Um, Malcolm Gladwell um, has exposed corresponding myths in relation to rationalize, our rationalizing of success. Uh, we believe that we deserve our accumulated personal wealth because we worked hard for it. Um, despite the evidence that personal wealth uh, largely results from a, from a, a quote, accumulative advantage uh, resulting from privilege, uh, circumstance and just coincidence. Um, yet, yet these two myths um, are actually really small compared to the giant myth of truth. <clears throat> uh, the commonly held myth of truth is that truth is objective, fixed, and enduring. Uh, truth exists whether we know it or not. Uh, it is our job to uh, unearth truth as it is. Uh, the growth of knowledge and understanding is the process of individuals and society exposing hidden truths uh, of the objective world, truths that have been there all along. Um, this myth has its roots in the philosophical traditions of ancient Greece. Uh, the myth is pervasive and it shapes all fields of Western thought and civilization and um, because of colonialism, imperialism, uh, globalization, it, it, it pretty much uh, affects uh, the thought process uh, in most all societies at this point in the world. Um, Yet, do truths change? Uh, humans once believed that the earth was flat. Uh, people believed that witches floated on water. Uh, many white people believed, and unfortunately some continue to believe, that their race is superior to that of other races. Uh, the concept of zero didn't even manifest itself in the Western world until just about 600 years ago. Is zero real? Did zero exist before uh, people? Uh, does zero perhaps only exist uh, because it took root in a human psychological niche within a fertile time? Uh, these are just some things to think about. Uh, knowledge, as it turns out, is a sociocultural phenomenon. And because of this, the scale on which truth operates is different from that of uh, the human personal scale. Um, and, and as such, truths often seem static, static and fixed from the human perspective. Okay, so now, normally I would go into a long-winded um, uh, exploration of the symbol grounding problem of cognitivism and an extension rationalism. Uh, I would then introduce some very a very technical explanation of cognition using the framework of complex systems or complex adaptive systems, um, cognitive neuroscience, and what we call embodied cognition. Um, all of this is profoundly uh, interesting to me. Uh, however, but it it often seems painfully boring for most people. Um, the problem that I face right now, at, at this point, at this stage of the, of the presentation, is that uh, if I don't provide for you uh, the empirical scientific evidence of what I'll talk about, I'll probably come across as a bit of a transcendental hippie guru, which I don't want to come across as. And yet at the same time, though, if I... Um, lay out the evidence and assemble it in a coherent fashion, uh, you'll probably tune out uh, within about 15-20 minutes. Uh, so if you want the evidence supporting what I will say, 
you know, I encourage you to watch the video that I mentioned before. You can't teach. It's it's connect. It's uh, linked uh, on this YouTube video. So just humor me for a moment, okay? And assume that there is no objective truth. <clears throat> the things that we normally associate with objective truth are actually continual blendings uh, sh of of shared experience. Uh, in this way, truth and understanding emerge from an ongoing interaction uh, of our physical selves with other individuals and with our physical environment. This means that our cognition is inextricably tied to others and to our environment. And here when I say environment, I, I mean anything outside of your physical body or what we normally like to think of uh, as our physical body. Okay? This means that you cannot separate your understanding at any level from other people or from the external environment. I know that that sounds a little bit radical, but actually what we're really finding from researching cognitive science is, is that this is actually the case. Um, uh, this is the primary premise behind embodied cognition, which is currently our most sophisticated understanding of cognition uh, within the sciences. Uh, I will give you uh, just kind of one example of how uh, research within um, cognitive sciences, cognitive linguistics, uh, psycholinguistics ends up resulting um, with this understanding of how really connected and tied together we are. Uh, although we have traditionally um, uh, seen ourselves as really separate and distinct uh, minds and individuals. <clears throat> So, uh, I'll just introduce to you uh, uh, two um, uh, bodies of research uh, of, of two individuals. Uh, Dr. Stephen Levinson, uh, the scientific director at the Max Planck Institute for Psycholinguistics, uh, has shown that people perform spatiologic tasks uh, differently depending upon their primary frame of reference of their, of their distinct language. Um, essentially what I'm saying is that uh, our performance of certain cognitive, spatio-cognitive tasks, uh, we perform differently based upon uh, differences within our languages. Um, I won't go into it uh, too much here. Um, in other research, uh, Dr. Pierre E. O'Dyer, um, he's a research scientist at France's National uh, Institute for Researching Computer Sciences and Controls, uh, he, using uh, models of the human laryngeal system, uh, the auditory system, and the neural system, or the uh, neural system, has shown that phonemes, uh, which are the foundations of speech, um, syllables, colloquially, uh, will self-organize. Phonemes will self-organize via interactions between individuals. Um, and so I know that I'm simplifying a lot of this for brevity, uh, but when we combine both Levinson's work and uh, O'Dyer's work, uh, we find we we're we can't but we come to the conclusion that an individual's cognition is inseparably tied to that of other people, uh, to other individuals, uh, to our cognition is inseparably tied to our language and even inseparably tied to our culture in which our culture is dependent upon geography and um, topography and things like that. Really interesting stuff. So I really want to explain further um, but I actually really want to get into the implications that our modern understanding of cognition has for education. Um, so our understanding of cognition is paramount to education. Why? Well, the reason why is because perennialism and essentialism, um, uh, which emphasize the instruction, instruction, i.e. transfer, of core truths, these kinds of objective truths, from one individual to another, from the teacher, the teacher has knowledge, the teacher gives knowledge to the students. Um, uh, these, these, these tenets of perennialism and essentialism dominate our educational system, our educational structure, our educational paradigm. Um, the, the foundations of our entire educational system are, broadly construct, are, are a broadly constructed mythology. 
a mythology that is largely an illusion. Uh, the illusion that knowledge is independent of the individual and that knowledge is transferable. Not the case. Um, <clears throat> there are no core truths uh, and the transfer of knowledge within, as a unit from one individual to another is, uh, is physically, impossi is physically impossible. <clears throat> Once we come to terms with the empirical evidence that all truth and understanding uh, is, uh, are negotiated and culturally coordinated uh, through meaningful interaction, we can then begin to move away uh, from uh, a system where knowledge is compartmentalized and then fed in units to students as they move down uh, the production line of industrial education. <clears throat> our conceptualization of learning needs to change. Okay? Learning is not something that happens consciously. Uh, and given our cognitive system, it's actually impossible for us not to learn. I'll repeat that one more time. Given our cognitive system, it's actually impossible for us not to learn. It's, I think that's really important for us to to realize. Learning and the motivation to learn is, is biologically as much a part of us as our um, biological predisposition towards food acquisition or sexual reproduction. Uh, this is because our successful acquisition of food or our successful um, sexual reproduction actually depends, absolutely depends upon learning. Um, given some recent pioneering research uh, into the role of dopamine uh, in, the, in learning, uh, an increasing number of neuroscientists believe that we are actually biologically motivated towards maximizing learning outcomes. This dispels the myth that there are children who are just not motivated to learn. Uh, whereas we sometimes will say uh, that certain students are poor students or unteachable students, uh, really from a cognitive perspective this is not the case. There is no such thing as bad students. Um, it just happens that, that the local um, and home environments for many children um, and uh, the various personality types of many children uh, are just not, not compatible uh, with, with the standardized educational structures of the wider culture um, or the wider civilization. And so as such, we have, we have educational structures that, that not only fail to meet the needs of many learners, but, but actually in the process, um, actually inherently demoralize and shame learners. <laughs> so we don't need, we, so our educational system fails to meet the needs of many learners and in the process as well shames and demoralizes many learners. Um, and I'll, let's just try one hypothetical example here real quickly. Okay? Um, so uh, hypothetical. Uh, there is a preschool age young girl who is raised by her loving grandparents after her parents die in a car crash, uh, in a car accident. Her grandmother, her grandparents are illiterate. Um, she learns to hunt for food, grow vegetables, and sew and knit her own clothing. Uh, she has no literary habits whatsoever upon entering elementary school. Uh, which, statistically speaking, means that she will perform in the bottom quartile through, statistically speaking, she will perform in the bottom quartile throughout the course of her primary uh, career, her primary education. Um, she can hunt, grow vegetables, and knit better than any of the other students in her school. Um, Yet, our evaluatory structure will implicitly 
communicate to her that she is inadequate uh, in comparison to most of her peers. Uh, the categorical and somewhat arbitrary, I would argue com largely arbitrary uh, standardization of knowledge uh, and skills likely relegates her to low self-esteem issues and all of the psychological and physical issues that accompany low self-esteem issues. <clears throat> So I know that this is a bit of, of an extreme example, okay? but this is actually what happens more subtly uh, every day within our educational system, uh, within, it, within our current system, within its current structure. Uh, now I'm not suggesting that we move away from literary, scientific, and mathematical knowledge. Uh, however, I, I think that we can meet and surpass our current educational objectives while attending to other human characteristics and without the emotional suffering that many of our children endure. Um, there are roughly 25 different types of neurons in the human brain. Uh, they are all important to the properly functioning brain. Okay? Analogously, there are uh, 16 different personality types according to the Myers-Briggs Myers personality type indicator, the MBTI, um, or according to Howard Gardner's theory of multiple intelligence, there are eight different uh, primary types of intelligence. Um, all of these cognitive profiles are important to the cognitive network of our civilization. Um, yet, I've had students tell me that, that, they, that their personality traits uh, make them feel shameful. L quote, shameful. So, essentially, uh, students, some students feel shame for the characteristics and traits that make them who they are. Okay, and, and I I don't think that that's right, especially when we, when we begin to recognize how important all of these traits are within the social fabric of our civilization and of our society. Okay, uh, I really want you to think about that. That if student, if a student's learning environment is segregated and compartmentalized uh, and decontextualized. Uh, then this is the cognitive framework that we are in fact facilitating or, or fostering. Uh, rather than categorizing and, uh, and distinguishing students based upon uh, uh, their arbitrary fit within the status quo, uh, we should focus on facilitating meaningful interaction among students and the larger community. Uh, I am talking about moving our educational paradigm closer to what it means to be human uh, and, and to be alive. <clears throat> this transformation is not going to originate from any one person. Uh, we like to put our faith into the elusive great leader. Uh, this conveniently allows us to shift responsibility away from ourselves onto some indistinct other. This transformation will not come from me because I'm not funny. I can't cook lasagna. I don't know how to fish. I don't know how to raise vegetables. I'm not a carpenter. I'm not a musician. I'm pathetic at sewing. I don't enjoy math. My attention to detail is not good enough for accounting. And my knot tying is absolutely pathetic. My point is that this transformation comes from a recognition and acceptance that you have something to share with this world. And what you have to share, as long as it's not hatred, is valid and valuable. We don't have, we don't have to know everything. Uh, and we are certainly never finished learning. I am not finished learning, you are not finished learning, this is a process that we continue along. If we accept that learning is a process, 
a socio-cultural process, then the game of education changes. Education and learning becomes more about increasing and motivating meaningful interaction between all members of the community. Learning always occurs uh, contextually and meaningfully. There is, there is so much more meaning and context in a game of cards that involves addition and subtraction uh, uh, compared, uh, compared to a, a teacher teaching addition and subtraction within a classroom. Uh, building a doghouse together or cooking dinner together brings context and learning together in a meaningful way. This recognition of learning will help make education a more enjoyable, life-affirming journey uh, without burdening our children with the emotional and psychological stress of our current structure. Okay, So, I'm finished now. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, you're able, uh, I was able to uh, coordinate with you a, a vague understanding of some of the ideas that I, I was trying to communicate. Um, if you have any questions, I encourage you to please, you know, um, shoot me an email or, you know, uh, send me a comment on Facebook, whatever you'd like. Um, I, I think that the dialogue is, is what's really important. Uh, in regards to us really working forward and, and moving forward and progressing forward, uh, and, I, and I look forward, I look forward to the dialogue. Actually, I'm 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 deriving a lot of meaning out of this. Uh, hope, hopefully, uh, I can find some other people out there interested in and uh, in and um, fleshing this out. Uh, take care of yourself. Uh, I wish you all the best in life. Um, I wish you happiness. I wish you uh, good relations etc. Uh, I wish you peace. All right. Take care. Bye.